In this video, we're going to talk about um, the power that monopsonies um, have in professional sports leagues. Okay. So first off, what is a monopsony? So think back, a monopoly is the sole seller of a good or service. A monopsony, on the other hand, is the sole buyer of a good or service. Okay. Now, they sound similar, and in reality, um, they're power is similar as well. And so while a monopolist uses its market power to drive the price up, it charges consumers, uh, a monopsonist uses its market power to drive down the prices that it pays um, either the producers um, that it buys its inputs from or the workers. Now a monopsonist maximizes their profits by restricting the quantity of the transactions relative to a perfectly competitive market talk about that in a second. And so the lower output and consumption um, impose a deadweight loss in society. So because if we're talking about workers specifically with monopsonies, they hire fewer workers than would be hired in a perfectly competitive labor market, which creates a deadweight loss for society. Now, when you look at the supply and demand of labor here, the other curve you have is the marginal expense of labor. So the marginal expense of labor is the additional expense of hiring an additional worker. Okay. So you might say, well, why doesn't that just equal the supply of labor? Okay. And the reason why is because um, in order to hire more workers, you have to raise your wage, okay. which is representing the upward sloping supply curve. However, when you raise that wage to get an additional worker, you're not just increasing the wage for the new worker, you also have to increase the wage for all existing workers as well. Okay. Otherwise, those workers would just go to another firm. And so what happens is whenever, if you wanna increase your quantity of labor supplied, you have to raise the wage and you do so such that you're not just increasing the wages for new workers, but also old workers as well. And so that's why you see the marginal expense of labor curve being higher than the supply of labor. Right. So in the labor market, the demand curve is the firm's marginal revenue product labor, which we've talked about in previous videos. Now, in a perfectly competitive market, um, the firms will hire at the point where the demand of labor equals the supply of labor, which is point S here. And so you will have a wage of WC and amount of labor at LC. The monopsonist, however, will hire workers um, as long as it's profitable to do so. So again, the marginal expense of labor is the additional cost of hiring an additional unit of labor. All right. The marginal revenue product of labor, which is the same as the demand of labor, is the additional benefit that the firm gets from hiring an additional worker. So as long as the marginal benefit right, of hiring an additional unit of labor is greater than the marginal expense of doing so, the firm will continue to hire. And they'll do so up to this point here, which is R. After that point, the additional labor you hire is costing more than the firm's going to be making. And so what happens then is you have this LM level of labor, which is the profit maximizing labor level. Now, the firm doesn't need to pay that marginal expense. They just need to pay um, the amount necessary to get that level of labor, which you can find by the supply of labor curve. And so they'll go up to point T. So a monopsonist will hire at the point of LM and pay at the point of WM. So with the monopsonist, compared with perfect competition, you have fewer workers and a lower wage being paid. And because there's fewer workers, the difference of LC and LM, you have this triangle here, which is a deadweight loss to society. So this is that's one way that firms are able to use their monopsonic power to their um, benefit. So 
Monopsony powers can be undermined by um, the entry of, comp of competing employers in general, and in sports that would be competing leagues or teams. Okay. So this is why they try to take steps to keep other leagues out, because okay, that would erode their monopsony power. Um, now, the monopsony power in Major League Baseball um, a lot of times would stem from what was known as the reserve clause. All right, so let's talk about that for a second. So initially, professional sports, professional baseball players um, move freely from team to team. Okay, they could go out, they could, you know, even in the middle of the season, just go to a different team. Um, and so going back 100 and almost 150 years now, in 1876, William Hubert was the financial backer of the Chicago White Stockings, um, now the Chicago White Sox, uh, appealed to other of the backers of these teams to create a new system that would stop the bidding war for players. So what would happen was the players would leave one team for another for more money. So what they did was they overthrew baseball's existing structure, all right, and the National Association of Professional Baseball Players, okay, which is what it was. The new organization was known as the National League of Professional Baseball Clubs, now known as the National League. Um, it let the clubs and their owners reign supreme, and the players really occupied a secondary position. So by 1889, teams were reserving their entire roster and had written to effect what was known as the Reserve Clause. All right. So this says that the player and the club have not agreed upon terms of such contract for the next playing season, then on or before 10 days after March 1st of the year, the club shall have the right to renew this contract for a period of one year on the same terms that the account payable to the player should be, sh shall be such as the club shall fix in said notice. So what does that say? That says that the clause restricted a player to his teams for the length of his contract Plus, if the team renewed the existing contract, one additional year of service. So this put all the um, power with the owners. Right. Um, now, the mono this created a massive amount of monopsony power. Right. Um, it left the players in a very weak position. Now, in order to improve their bargaining power, players formed the Major League Baseball Players Association, in 1953. And then jump ahead 15 years to 1968. This is when the MLPBA, the Major League, I'm oh, sorry, MLBPA, Major League Baseball Players Association negotiates first collective bargaining agreement with the league. And since then, um, there have been other um, players in other leagues that have formed similar associations, the National Basketball Players Association, the National Hockey League Asso Players Association, and the National Football League Players Association. Right. And these all have unique forms of unions. Okay. So the reserve clause we're going to talk about more in another video, but this just talks about the um, how the owners use their monopsony power. Okay. So Again, these are just three quick ways that the professional sports leagues have used their, um, or a couple of quick ways that the sports leagues have been able to use and exploit their monopsony power.